I'm Rebecca Fife with the Illinois Mycological Association and also with Scientific Medicinals and I'm joined today by John Holliday of Aloha Medicinals who is in my opinion the preeminent mycologist in the West on medicinal fungi. Welcome John. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you. And you got into mycology through your engineering background and it's allowed you to do some things in the laboratory that would probably be pretty difficult to achieve for someone who didn't have an engineering background. Would you tell us a little bit about what you do in your lab? I was working for the Navy modifying their nuclear submarines and every day I'd come out of the engine room and I'd walk by a door that says nuclear weapons department. And every day I'd, I'd go home and I'd say, what am I doing with my life? And so I was mentioning it to a friend one day and she said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, grow mushrooms. And she said, well, grow mushrooms. <laughs> So, That's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. So I went, okay, and I quit the Navy. And I, but I took that engineering background and I took it into the large-scale cultivation of medicinally active mushrooms. So I've been into apothecaries in various Chinatowns and I've seen these and I had read that, um, you know, what the Chinese use them for. Those are Cordyceps sinensis from Tibet. Generally today, we only find those above 14,000 feet, and they come up for about two weeks out of the year. I always wanted to try them, but I was off-put by, you know, ingesting this worm, grinding up, or putting this in my soup, until I found your Cordyceps product, and then I was comfortable trying the worm-free version. Can you tell me the difference between this, you know, worm with a fruiting body coming out of its head, and what you produce um, in your cordyceps? First, it's interesting on, on this worm-fungus relationship. The medicinal properties are not in the fungus. They're in the body of the caterpillar because the entire caterpillar has been digested and bioconverted into fungal compounds, except for just the very outer cuticle, which on this type of caterpillar is made out of chitin, and so essentially, the body of the caterpillar becomes the reservoir for those extracellular compounds. So some people that don't like the idea of eating caterpillar will break the head off and throw it away, and that's just <laughs> missing out. The main difference with ours is it's grown with no caterpillar. It's a completely vegetarian base, and it's consistent. Every lot, all year long, from January to December, is exactly the same thing. We have constant strain development going on, substrate development, and uh, the product that we produce in the laboratory is about five to eight times more potent than the best wild collected cordyceps that you can get. Besides which, cordyceps in the wild is no longer a sustainable business. Uh, there's about 60 tons a year produced in Tibet, and it's just destroying the habitat, but it's worth its weight in gold, worth more than gold today. So it's going to continue on until there's just none left at all. I take cordyceps every day, and I have a friend who won't try them because he says he's afraid that a mushroom will grow out of his head. What should I tell him, and, and how if it's a, if it's, you know, does this to a ghost moth, how does it stay in, in our intestinal tract and, and, and perhaps only benefit us? One of the real misunderstandings about cordyceps is most of the literature today still is describing it as a parasite that kills its host. Well, you know, that's... First off, it's not logical because nature selects out against parasites. In a small, harsh environment like the Tibetan Plateau, if it was so common, it would have wiped out the ghost moss. So we can say just logically it's not a parasite. So one of the first things that we looked at when we went to Tibet is what about the normal, adult, healthy, regular ghost moths and the larvae of them? And every moth that we find, you put a needle in it and you draw back and take some fluid out and you put it in a petri dish, it grows cordyceps. Wow. So cordyceps is found in all of the moths. Why does it come out of some of them? Well, I suspect that they die from some other cause. And when the conditions are right, that fungus, which is not an obligate symbiont, fruits and produces spores and goes downwind. You see, our red blood cells at one time in our evolutionary past were parasites. And eventually they became symbiotic with the creatures they live with, and in most cases today are obligate symbionts, where I can't raise the human and the red blood cell separate from each other. But insects don't have red blood cells. They haven't evolved red blood cells. Rather, they have single-celled yeast-like 
symbionts that perform all of the functions of the red blood cell. And this is what cordyceps is, these single-celled yeast-like symbionts. I know that you're very cautious about not claiming that mushrooms prevent or cure any illness, mm -hmm. but perhaps could you tell me people who do use cordyceps because they want to enhance their health or because they believe that it treats an illness, what uh, do they report? What are the common uses around the world that people report using it for? The main use of most medicinal mushrooms is to enhance immune function. Uh, most countries use these mushrooms or mushroom-derived compounds in clinical practice. Uh, this is not part of our culture here. Uh, under our regulatory system, a thing has to go through pharmaceutical approval before it can be used in a clinical setting. So while we use mushroom products as dietary supplements in America, uh, the primary use in most of the world is either in cancer or in HIV treatment. Cordyceps has antiviral compounds which are as effective or more effective than the pharmaceutically available drugs today, but they are non-toxic. And so that's the main use for cordyceps sinensis is antiviral use. A lot of sick people turn to mushrooms as supplements, but a lot of healthy people, including peak performance athletes, use them too. What are some ways that mushrooms are being employed as performance enhancers? Cordyceps increases the ATP molecule in the body. Greater quantities of ATP, greater energy capacity. However, most of us don't work anywhere near the limits of our ATP capacity. If you're a marathon runner or something, you'll definitely see the difference. But for the average housewife or businessman, they're not working anywhere near the limits of ATP, so that doesn't come into play. The other thing is cordyceps increases the absorption of oxygen dramatically. I think because moths are not very good flyers. And cordyceps living in the moth in the Himalayas gave them an advantage over the birds who couldn't catch them. Right? And so very easy to measure. The air around us is about 20 percent oxygen and so we're breathing it in at 20 percent and out at about 13 percent. After two weeks on cordyceps we find that we're breathing it in at 20% and out at about 8%. Wow. So we've got like a 40% increase in the oxygen utilization from the cordyceps. Mushrooms can be used for an athletic performance enhancer, but I've heard that they are also perhaps a sexual performance enhancer. Tell me what you know about that. A uh, strong sex drive is the sign of a healthy person. And as we drift off of that optimal health, that homeostasis, let's say, we tend to lose sex drive as one of the early signs of immune dysfunction. There's been quite a bit of research primarily with cordyceps sinensis for both male and female uh, sexual dysfunction. Uh, Dr. George Halpern and a doctor from China by the name of Zhu published a paper in 1998 and a follow-up in 1999 detailing some of those early trials in male and female sexual dysfunction. And in fact, cordyceps is used quite widely today. One of the medical conditions that seems to be more common now, at least uh, I'm seeing more of it, are autoimmune conditions. And if people with autoimmune conditions want to um, try supplements or try something, they might be afraid of taking something that's an immune stimulator. I've heard that medicinal mushrooms are more of an immune regulator than an immune stimulator. What does that mean and how does that come into play for people who might be dealing with autoimmune conditions? We use a term like autoimmune disease. That's a very simple way of saying there's an imbalance between pro-inflammatory cells and anti-inflammatory cells because the body produces both. And inflammation is not good or bad. It is simply part of the immune response. What the immune modulators do is they balance that pro-inflammatory pro and anti-inflammatory cell types to bring things back into regulation. So if we look at a classic immune deficiency disease such as cancer or, or HIV, what we see is an increase in the white blood cells and an increased in immune response. When we give the same compounds to someone with a, a typical autoimmune disease, lupus, uh, some types of leukemia, for example, we see a down regulation of the white blood cells. 
So these are why it's called an immune modulator. It's a bi-directional type uh, immune modulation. Where would someone start if someone who is, you know, just young and healthy wants to get into supplementing with medicinal mushrooms? Today's best products are full spectrum products. Our company makes a product which is called Immune Assist Critical Care Formula, which is very highly purified immune modulator compounds from six species. So basically it's a broad spectrum immune enhancement. At, today's, at our level of science today, we don't have the ability to look at a patient and say, what aspect of immune dysfunction allowed the proliferation of this disease in the first place? And so, in my opinion, it is easier to have good patient response when we take a broad spectrum approach. Sort of like it's easier to hit the target with a shotgun rather than a laser beam. Your career has been absolutely an inspiration to me, and thank you so much for joining me.